Is there a bit of a story behind Forever that we didn't discuss before? Uh, well, the thing I remember that that song is, and this is generally what happened with stuff with Peter, I, I remember, which is why I think it works. Because for, for, I would be playing the guitar and just like, uh, something like that. And, and and I'd be playing around and I'd be playing guitar and and he'd go, I like that. And he'd just jump on it. And I, if he didn't say that, I would have just never played it again or not never. I just wouldn't have thought anything of it. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, by his catalyst, he was a catalyst really for, for going to jump on that. And then it would happen really quick after that. So I needed that, which was that's what happened with Man Who Came to Stay. I had that riff. He's like, that's what. And then it was just, there was, there was, he had his bit to it and it was a song. So um, that was generally how it went, and I remember I had I had I had this that that thing. It's really simple, it's just simple. And I'd been playing it for a couple of days, so I think I played it to him, and he's like, and he just jumped on it and really liked it. Now I, I vaguely remember. This sounds a bit weird, but I've there's a I remember pl- like uh, being like at three in the morning in a graveyard in Old Street in one of the church graveyard with him, and we were just been up for a couple of days. It was horrendous. And uh, I remember writing it in there with him. I don't, I don't know if that's my memory's warped or it was partly written there. And then, because I do remember after that, thinking this is really weird. And then walking up to the cafe in the morning, I opened at 6.30 in Hoxton with him. And, that's, and, then, and then I remember we, that's, that's my memory of that song being written. Yes. And obviously became... <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember Cole mentioned the graveyard thing, so I was hoping that story would come out, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'd be interested if Peter remembers that as well. Maybe it wasn't all fully worked in there, but I do remember being in there and just and him. I remember just Pete come up with the lyric that that lyric. And looking back, it's quite funny, isn't it? Like just in a graveyard in Old Street, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, uh, in top, you know, whatever. But yeah, it was there. It was there. It was. It was pretty. Yeah, um, yeah. With all the um, being up for a couple of days and all the edginess and. Anxiety and paranoia and not really getting along energy. <laughs> yeah, did you feel that obviously became like one of the biggest songs? Um, did you feel like it was going to be a, be a big song at the time when you wrote it? I thought it was quite anthemic. Someone, and lots of people really liked it. A lot of people thought that as well. A couple of people were like, just sounds they were just like uh, in the early days. Yeah, I thought that. I didn't really give a shit what other people thought. They like, sounds like Strokes or something like that, which I don't think it did sound like Strokes. It's because it's got that thing in it. Which is the strokes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. right, okay. It's just a, it's just a chord. It's just the, the, the sorry, not even. It's just the, the way you're playing the, the riff. It's just two notes. It's just like it's a skeleton of a chord. Um, that sound, but um, yeah, because when we wrote it, and by the time we recorded it, I did have a feeling it was going to do quite well because also the response it got from gigs was fucking crazy. Mm. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. I remember off at the end. Well, it was kicked off throughout the whole gigs, those early gigs, but it, it, it was pretty raucous. People really liked it. And it did have a bit of hype behind it. I remember there was all these, not you give a shit, but there was loads of articles being written saying, oh, this is like anthem- anthemic and what have you. I remember um, the Zane Lur recording he did of it. I always thought that was the best version. And uh, Yeah, that was remember- quite, quite savage, wasn't it? There was, a, there was a version of that that was powerful. Um, no, yeah, there was a there was another live session somewhere I think as well, which was sludgier but cool. Yeah, uh, um, there was also a version we did with Nelly Hooper, which I don't know where it is. If anyone's got it, I'd love to like hear it because it sounded, from what I remember, uh, like I like the version we got. It sounds like it's very much encapsulate encapsulates that whole era and time because it was like the drums sound like recorded in a. In, in a military base or something in a barn I don't know so they're really it's just trashy sounding and quite trebly but um, I remember we Pete didn't turn up we went to, to Nelly Hooper's studio to do it and uh, or to either to do it or do overdubs or just make they wanted it to sound more radio friendly to be honest like more um, I don't know, smashing pumpkins or something I don't know just bigger drums and bigger guitars like you know Nirvana guitars but um, didn't end up happening but we did there is a version of it somewhere but um, I think Pete didn't want to do it because it would upset Mick, which is fair enough. So they replaced drums and all that kind of stuff. So I don't even know. My, my, I don't even know how it would sound now. But um, I remember at the time thinking this sounds really fucking powerful. But um, it sounded really different. But yeah. It sounds, no. yeah, it's interesting. Like who decides that becomes a single? Do you have like? Do you reckon the band had uh, the ability to do that? Obviously, it's not going to be very radio friendly, as the lyrics mention at one point. 
don't know how that happened. Became single. I think just it just was like general consensus that it was quite going to be the one. Kind of, I, if that track had been done with Nelly Hooker, it would sound so out of so out, so out of base if it had gone like in uh, in relation to the rest of the record. Anyway, do you know what I mean? It would sound like an anomaly because uh, the production would be so different. But yeah, who decided that? I don't know. It sort of happened. I think it was like pretty obvious that that was going to be just a reaction it was getting. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, Adam told us a bit about the video, which is quite funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is after a big night out or something, and then or a big gig, and you have to go to some farm to film it in East London, and then the funny interview with Simon Amstel as well. Yeah, and then it was, I remember, yeah, it was, I'm trying to remember. And, and some of it was filmed in the um, cinema on um, in Dalston as well. Is it the Rio? No, what's that cinema on, on Dalston Kingsland? On Kingsland yeah, Rio cinema, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I cut my hand just before that on a bottle. Oh, God. Quite badly. Uh, I remember they're doing the video and they're like, what the fuck? Because it was really gashing, bleeding. I didn't really care, but I think they all freaked out. Um, yeah, I don't really remember much about, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Your reaction <laughs> in the um, the video of that interview is quite funny. I just found it quite funny, the whole awkwardness. <laughs> That's weird, isn't it? Looking back on that. <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was odd. It was odd. <laughs> it was you can funny. tell it wasn't planned there because you're like, you can tell you just don't know what's going on. It's funny. Yeah, I'm just not used to doing that kind of stuff. I never liked that. Yeah, so yeah. It's sort of like, and, and you know, substances involved in there. It's like, I was just, sounded really odd and weird and funny. So. <laughs> <laughs>